Okay, so thank you very much for joining us in our webinar, how to choose between an MDiv and an MA. So we have two panelists here. <clears throat> so Dr. Abernathy is over the MA in biblical exegesis. And you can see um, down under his school where it says Trinity, that he chose to do an MDiv. Again, that's at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. And then also we're gonna be giving away a few books. And so one of them will be Dr. Abernathy's new book, God's Messiah in the Old Testament. Okay, our second panelist is Dr. Mark Cortez, and he oversees three programs, MA in Theology, MA in History of Christianity, as well as the MA in Biblical and Theological Studies. Uh, Dr. Cortez also happens to be one of our PhD mentors. And there you can see that he did, he chose an MA as well as a THM at Western Seminary. And we will also be giving away uh, his book called Resourcing Theological Anthropology, A Constructive Account of Humanity in the Light of Christ. Um, and then also just wanted to mention that we will have one other book that we'll be giving, uh, uh, having a drawing for, <clears throat> and that's by, it, by Reverend Esau McCulley. He is a a professor here at Wheaton of New Testament, and his book is called Reading While Black, African-American Biblical Interpretation as an Exercise in Hope. So let's get started. Let me turn off <clears throat> the share screen just a moment. And let's start with a basic question. Um, what, uh, what led you to your choice of school, and also what was behind your thoughts on an MA or an MDiv? And Dr. Abernethy, if you would start us. Yeah, great, great question. I thank you for having me on this panel, and really glad to uh, jump in and uh, be a sounding board for uh, those who, who who tune in. This is a huge question. Uh, especially for those who have some sort of a, a calling uh, heart uh, towards uh, ministry, but also maybe more academically inclined, and you're thinking, wow, what, what is the right path uh, for me? When I was uh, an undergrad, I, I actually, um, yeah, I would kind of describe myself as an unexpected academic. <laughs> I, I was not following the Lord. I, I was not really going to class in my first few years of school. I was partying my uh, brains out and not um, really, I certainly wouldn't have thought I'd be pursuing biblical education. I um, uh, turned to the Lord midway through my sophomore year and found myself at a Christian liberal arts undergrad college. And before I know it, uh, as a, a midway through uh, really my first semester there, I, I just started loving to read and study the Bible. And eventually I uh, sensed a call to minister God's word and I had no clue what that would look like. Um, so as I headed towards uh, graduation, I, I knew I, I needed some more time to mature uh, in my walk with God and mature as a person before I would be in a um, kind of ministry uh, role. And so the MDiv was just a natural uh, degree for me where I wasn't quite sure where God would be leading. You know, would it be pastoral ministry? Would it be overseas? And I wasn't really thinking of academic ministry because I'd been such a bad student early in my uh, my degrees. But my grades did actually get better uh, towards the end of my undergrad. And um, I knew I wanted to go to a school where I would be um, uh, equipped uh, to minister God's word and for me, that meant being able to study the scriptures in their original languages. And Trinity Evangelical Divinity School was a school I had heard great things about um, in terms of training people for uh, carefully studying uh, God's word. And um, so after visiting uh, there, it made it, it seemed like it would be a good fit. And it turned out to be a great fit. Um, and, and I'm sure we'll talk more about what an MDiv has to offer, but I would just say along with studying God's word, I was able to get a full suite of theology and um, 
you know, pastoral related classes uh, and those sorts of things. Thank you, Dr. Cortez. Would you go ahead, please? Yeah, so um, my journey looked a little bit different from Andy's um, in that uh, I had felt a call to youth ministry fairly early on in my development. I was actively involved in various youth groups uh, as a teenager. I uh, started getting involved in middle school ministry while I was still in high school. Uh, so I came out of high school pretty committed to youth ministry as my vocations. I went to an undergraduate school, Multnomah uh, University in Portland, Oregon, uh, got my bachelor's degree in theology. Uh, the similarity there, though, is that I was a terrible student, um, very much focused in the degree as um, a means to an end rather than the thing I actually found interesting in itself. Um, I'm like, if I'm going to become a youth pastor someday, they're probably going to want me to have a degree of some kind. So as long as I graduate, I'm good to go. Um, so I was not terribly focused on the academic side of things. Um, uh, yeah, I did find that to be valuable training to go on into youth ministry. Um, and um, I then worked as a youth pastor full-time and part-time for about 10 years, um, worked all the way through my undergrad and then was full-time for six years after graduate before I even considered the possibility of going to seminary. Um, actually had the odd circumstance of when we decided that I wanted to go back to seminary, I technically still hadn't finished my undergraduate degree because uh, I had gotten the job that I was interested in the <laughs> for in the first place. Uh, so my undergraduate transcript has like a six year gap in it where I wasn't doing anything and then desperately had to take a number of classes uh, so that I could finish that degree, go on and do seminary. Um, and I will say without hesitation that I chose Western Seminary for my degrees in Portland, Oregon, entirely based on geography. Um, I was a youth pastor in the area. My wife and I were expecting our first child. Uh, I actually had been accepted to go to Trinity and had flown out there to look at housing and whatnot. Um, and then we decided that staying closer to family with the first child was probably a better idea. Uh, so Andy, I turned heads down if you're curious. <laughs> um, <laughs> Ended up having a wonderful experience at Western, but it was it was all about geography and just what, what worked best for the family at the time, uh, which is obviously a legitimate factor to take into consideration with these kinds of decisions. Absolutely, and I appreciate. Mark, what was your oh. Mark? What was your MA in? I did my, actually all of my degrees are in theology. Um, okay. so even when I was doing youth ministry preparation, I was doing systematic theology as my degree because I felt like that was important for youth ministry. Uh, then my MA was in, at the time they called it exegetical theology. Uh, yeah. I'm still not hundred percent sure what that is, but it was theology. And then my mm -hmm. THM was in theology as well. Okay. And, do, and when you chose to do that M MA, did you kind of think, you know, you may want to move in a more academic direction vocationally, or did, did you just say, Hey, I, I want to get more training. I love studying this stuff. Yeah, so that's, um, I think kind of our different stories on why we picked the degree programs that we picked will help also kind of tease out some of the differences between the two of them. So no, um, I did not think I was being called into academics. Uh, when I decided to go back to seminary, I was finishing up 10 years of service at the same church. My wife and I were pretty sure that our time of service at that church was coming to an end. Uh, we had been talking about doing seminary at some point, and so we thought this transition is a great time to do that. We're leaving this church anyway. Let's go do seminary. Um, I thought I was getting more training to continue on in youth ministry um, and uh, actually initially enrolled in an MDiv program at the seminary there. It's just what seemed like the logical next step. Uh, and for me, the turning point from the MDiv into the MA was really getting a better feel for the coursework that was required in the MDiv. Um, and um, comparing that against both work that I had done as an undergrad already and then training that I had received while doing ministry as a youth pastor uh, and feeling like there was a little bit too much replication of the training that I was going to get in an MDiv program. Yeah. So I felt um, both, I wasn't sure that I wanted to spend time taking those classes again or getting that training over again. I wasn't sure that I wanted that long of a degree program if it was going to involve some replication of content. So switching to the shorter and more focused MA program for me made the most sense. Yeah, yeah thank you, Dr. Cortez. Oh. Can you guys talk just real briefly about the differences in coursework between the MDiv and, and an MA, please? Yeah, why don't I talk about the MDiv? Um, and Mark and I have both, <clears throat> uh, since being professors, taught at s seminaries where MDivs are offered. I, I taught at one in, in Australia uh, called Ridley College, and Mark taught at Western. Um, I, um, 
the main kind of perspective of an MDiv is it's going to offer you a very well-rounded shaping uh, for a wide range of ministries. So you are going to get, um, there's going to be a Bible component to nearly every uh, MDiv, or there certainly should be. And for some uh, seminaries that will include learning uh, original languages to be able to better understand the Bible. And for some degrees, they've let go of requiring biblical languages as part of their curriculum. Um, students also in an MDiv will receive kind of the basic foundation of, you know, two or three systematic theology classes where they're exposed to uh, doctrines about the nature of scripture, the nature of humanity, the nature of creation, the doctrine of salvation, um, the church, Holy Spirit, you know, all, all of the big theological questions you're going to get exposed to a general kind of what are the key vantage points to keep in mind when you're thinking about these doctrines. Most MDivs will also have a history of uh, Christianity side of things where you'll take like a church history class where you'll get a feel for the history of the church. Those are more of the academic side of a degree, but then the MDiv will also offer um, classes like preaching classes. And when Mark said he probably didn't feel a need to take an MDiv after he'd been preaching for <laughs> 10 years at that point, you know, he, he probably didn't need another preaching class. Um, there's pastoral care uh, classes that you take. There may even be denominational distinctive classes you take, pastoral counseling classes, uh, and even general classes on missions and apologetics and discipleship. So um, someone, the beauty of an MDiv is for people who feel called in general to ministry and they're not sure where they want to go, they get a really wide a foundation that's laid for them that can serve as a kind of launching pad into a range of uh, different uh, ministries. Um, so that, that gives a sense for, for the MDiv. Yeah, the question on the MA side is a little bit trickier to answer because there's so many different kinds of MA programs. Um, MDiv programs, uh, as Andy's laid out, have a relatively standard form to them. They, they change in length. But most of them, other than the languages, most of them are trying to accomplish the same kinds of things. Uh, so your Bible bucket, your theology bucket, your history bucket, your ministry skills bucket. And they're trying to put at least some things in each of those various buckets. Uh, your MA programs will tend to specialize in one of those particular areas. Uh, so an MA theology program, you're going to get some Bible classes and some history classes. Uh, and if you're at the kinds of schools that Andy and I gravitate toward, you're going to get a lot of talk about how theology relates to the life and ministry of the church. So it's not as though an MA program is so focused that you're not touching on any of those other things, but it's really going to specialize in the curriculum um, in one of those particular areas. And so you're going to dig deep into theology, um, into Old Testament, New Testament, or possibly both. Um, church history, ministry, uh, in a very focused sort of way. Uh, so the, an, an analogy that I've often used with students uh, is you can think with both degree programs as if you're developing a set of tools. Uh, with the MDiv program, you're developing a very wide range of tools, but you're only getting like one or two of each tool. Uh, so you're going to end up with your toolbox is going to have, you're going to have like a screwdriver, a hammer, well, probably two hammers, everybody needs two hammers, um, you know, a wrench or two and whatnot. So you're going to have a lot of tools, but not a ton of each. Uh, whereas with one of your master's programs, uh, you're probably going to end up with less breadth. Uh, you might not have, um, you know, a certain kind of wrench in your toolbox or whatnot, uh, but you're going to have a lot of screwdrivers, right? You're, you're going to develop a, a very wide range of tools. Uh, the other thing that I think is helpful for thinking about the difference is, um, as much as I love the MDiv program, and, and I'm a big fan of the MDiv program, even though Wheaton doesn't have one, I encourage people to consider them uh, and look at schools that do offer them. Uh, one of the frustrations that I have noticed the students often have with MDiv programs is because you're, you're focusing so much on bread. Uh, and you're getting kind of introductions to each discipline, which is outstanding. They often find it frustrating that they don't actually get to, to take the next step. It's like I learned about New Testament, but I didn't get to spend a lot of time actually doing New Testament studies. Or, or I got a great theology survey, but I never really got to spend time 
you know, digging deeply into theology. I hear it most often in the languages. Um, you know, I learned Greek, but I never actually got to use it because there's just not space. Uh, even though the MDiv is a long program, by the time you've done that kind of bread and have introduced students to that many different topics, there's relatively little space in those programs to go further with more than maybe one. Uh, and so uh, an, an MA program tends to give you that opportunity. You've already developed a sense of, I find this aspect of biblical theological training fascinating enough that I want to spend more time digging deeply into it and really extending my knowledge of this particular field. And that's what the MA program does well. And Mark, I, I should jump in um, <clears throat> and just clarify that the length of the MDiv program tends to be somewhere between 70 and 90 credit hours and typically students will plan to take about if you're going full-time around three years uh, to finish that degree um, ma degrees are um, occasionally you'll see a one-year degree um, but they're usually uh, geared to be a two-year um, program so um, Andy, why don't you talk for a little bit, now that we've got a bit of a clearer sense of what the MAA is, what the MDiv is, and what they're trying to accomplish, why did you do an MDiv? Yeah, you know, honestly, I didn't, um, I didn't even know what an MA was uh, when I was coming out. I, I didn't know that was an option. And perhaps the reason I didn't know an MA was an option was because I hadn't really honed in on one area that I was really excited about. So I'm sure when I got brochure materials, there were MA and Old Testament. I'm an Old Testament professor now, but I, I didn't have that flagged in my mind as an area that I wanted to go deep more deeply in. So because I hadn't had a ton of training in my undergrad, even though I was able to take a few Bible and theology classes, I kind of felt like what I got in my undergrad was just like this initial exposure, but I needed to start back over again with an MDiv and um, have that full suite of studies and be open to see where God would want to lead me from there. I, I didn't know clearly where um, God would lead. And, and like you, Mark, I, I ended up becoming a youth pastor for uh, three years at, at the end of my uh, MDiv, so, which was great. And, um, you know, so I, for me, an M, the MDiv was, was a great program for me, given the fact, like you had said, Mark, um, I didn't have like this one area that I knew I was really interested in and wanted to get six screwdrivers, <laughs> you know, I, I liked, I was excited about learning about the hammers and the, the wrenches and the saws and, you know, all that, uh, all of those things. So, so I think it turned out to be a really good degree for me. And, and as it turned out, seminary I chose was a really academically minded MDiv program uh, gave really uh, you know certain MDiv programs will be lighter on the academic side but my MDiv was strong enough academically that I was able to go from an MDiv into a PhD program but that's that's not always uh, always the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's a good point. We've been talking about the MDiv as if it is relatively generic from one school to the other. And there's a yeah. sense kind of in which that's the case. Uh, but given that curricular breadth in the MDiv, no school is going to be equally good at all of those things. They yeah. will tend to lean more on one or the other. Uh, so if you're thinking about MDivs, it's worth kind of digging in a little bit to find out, does this school tend to do pastoral care better? Is it more of a missionally oriented school and does more kind of cultural engagement kinds of things well? Uh, is it more into the Bible? Does it have a lot of theology or maybe philosophy? That you're, They're going to have unique strengths on those things that you'll want to compare to your own. Uh, yeah. How do, you, how do you find that out? What, who do you talk to or what, what questions would you ask to find that out? Yeah, I would say um, you always want to talk, to, if you can, to current or even ideally former students. Uh, that's a little bit trickier, but that's kind of your, your best way to go. Yeah. Um, the, the tricky thing is the easiest people to ask, are, of course, the people who are at the schools, and they don't always have the clearest sense, actually, of, kind of what their own strengths and weaknesses are. Um, but there, it doesn't hurt to ask and kind of find out. Um, yeah. I, 
I find it interesting also to ask um, uh, schools to kind of compare their relative strengths to other schools. Um, and then, of course, ask each of the schools that. So you're getting kind of a representative <laughs> balance of different perspectives on that. Yeah. Yeah, I would say, I, yeah, I, I'd say too, especially if you're feeling called to ministry, a conversation with like your pastor or denominational leaders um, will give you a really good sense of here are the sorts of uh, seminaries that train people well for ministry in our denomination. Um, and what, and this is a, another layer in the discussion um, is for some people, if you're feeling a call to church ministry, some denominations will require that you've had an MDiv degree. Um, because MDivs though are becoming um, less dominant, if you will, that, that more people are opting for MA degrees for a range of reasons, uh, denominations have also developed what they call an MDiv equivalency where they'll evaluate kind of your coursework, your ministry experiences and so forth to see if you've had sufficient training. So I think those pastors, um, your, your denominational leaders are really gonna um, be great resources for you as you think about um, uh, you know, your choice of whether to do an MDiv or an MA, but also will have some good ideas about what schools to go to. And, it, and as I think back, it was, it was a couple pastors um, who recommended, hey, you, you should go to Trinity. You should, you know, and for me, it was between Trinity and Gordon Conwell. And I um, went out and visited court, Gordon Conwell and I loved it. It was similar academic um, uh, in, kind of theological heritage as Trinity, but I chose Trinity mainly because I'm from the Midwest. And if I went to Gordon Conwell, I felt like I was gonna have to drive an hour and a half to find a church <laughs> to attend because there just aren't as many uh, churches, you know, in uh, the Northeast in the US. So I um, thought the Midwest would be a nice uh, option for being able to serve at churches while doing my MDiv, so. And the denominational piece there is of course critical. We've been approaching this conversation as if it was kind of legitimately open on whether you should do an MDiv or an MA. Um, if you're planning on ministering in a context that has certain requirements on what your degree is, uh, then that probably answers the question for you in a relatively straightforward way. Yeah. But I wouldn't just assume, as Andy was pointing out there, that because you're planning on going into pastoral ministry and planning on getting ordained, that you therefore have to do an MDiv. Uh, that, that is, um, there are certain spectrums of evangelicalism in the church where that isn't a requirement at all. Um, and then there are others where it has been, but there are changing kinds of sets of expectations uh, that that, we see um, some of it as well, uh, that traditionally um, uh, people were expected to come out with MDivs on, on route to the PhD. Uh, and that is, as far as I'm aware, um, either it's at least very unique that somebody would be required to have an MDiv uh, going into the PhD program anymore. Kim, you were going to say something? Yeah, I was just wondering, um, so that's a great question, like Andy brought up about MDivs are less and less necessary. And I was just wondering what kind of context, Mark, you had just mentioned, you know, different areas where an MA would be sufficient. And so, you know, what kind of um, situations would an MA be acceptable to a church to get into pastoral ministry? You, you know what's, um, yeah, and again, the, my answers are going to be unique to the students I relate with uh, in our MA and Biblical Life to Jesus program. But a lot of non-denominational churches aren't going to have an MDiv requirement. They're going to just evaluate someone based on their own kind of merits um, and what they training they've had and, and assess things on an individual basis. So I had a student who did an undergrad at a Christian college down south and really hadn't had a chance to really go deep in the biblical languages. And he, he felt called to be a preacher and wanted just to be strengthened in studying the scriptures and the original languages so that he can handle the word of God more faithfully in a ministry context. 
and now he's going out and he's planting a church in Wyoming or, or somewhere, uh, which is always exciting to, to see. I've also seen, um, you know, um, denominations that have a robust vision for training um, students for ministry within the local church and we're within the denomination where they're going to have internship opportunities they're going to be training uh, students on the job kind of in the church for preaching for pastoral care they may see less of a need for an mdiv because they're taking on some of that training and shaping themselves um, for people for pastoral ministry so we have um, a string of um churches in the Wheaton area where there are Anglican uh, ministers there who have done the MA in biblical exegesis in the past and they're recommending to certain students hey why don't you go do your MA in biblical exegesis and we'll just make sure that we can round you out and give you good theological training uh, on the Anglican side of theology and as well as practice um, so those are just a couple examples where I've seen um, in MDiv, MDiv fitting in well. And, and I guess if I could clarify one thing that, that I've, has been assumed in a number of my comments as well as Mark's, I do think it makes a bit of a difference if you've had an undergrad degree in Bible and theology already. If, if you've gone to a Christian college and had quite a bit of um, Bible and theology, um, then the a big question is, is is it worth doing an MDiv if there's going to be a lot of overlap between what the MDiv is covering and what you've um, kind of been able to do as part of your undergrad uh, degree? And in those instances, uh, you see increasingly um, a drift towards an MA uh, seems to be um, a, a good option for a number of those students. Um, if I can just come back to the PhD comment that I made earlier as well, Kim, because you asked about different contexts where an MA um, might be adequate. Um, you can get into most of the PhD programs that I'm familiar with, with an MA. Um, the other advantage to an MA that's probably worth keeping in mind is you compare it to the, the length of an MDiv. Uh, a lot of schools have the ability to uh, kind of double up on an MA, pro on MA programs at the same school where the second MA has a reduced length because you've already done an MA at that school, uh, which means you actually can in many places complete two MA programs in yeah. a comparable amount of time to an MDiv program. Yeah. Uh, and so if you're really gonna kind of compare apples to apples to some extent, uh, you know, cause we're gonna give the MDiv kind of kudos for all of the many things that it can do with its, you know, 80 or 90 credits. Um, it's worth kind of reflecting as well as what could you do if you had devoted the same amount of time to an MA program. Yeah. Uh, and it, I know working with Wheaton's PhD uh, program, our best applicants are often applicants that have two MAs. Uh, they do better in our interviews. They tend to do better in the program than either students that have one MA or an MDiv. Uh, the two MA students are often better prepared for doctoral work. What are the two types of MAs as an example, Mark? So, oh, oh. oh so it's kind of by, by two types. I mean, generally speaking, they fall into two broad categories in the, you know, the seminary Christian higher education world. You've got your more ministerial MA programs and your more academic MA programs. Uh, so your ministerial MA programs would be like an MA in youth ministry, an MA in pastoral care and counseling, an MA in leadership or evangelism, or any of those MA programs that are really uh, focused on developing a particular set of skills for effective ministry. And they, of course, will also have Bible and theology and whatnot in them, but their specialization will be to prepare you um, uh, typically for one kind of aspect of uh, vocational ministry. Your academic programs, again, it's not as though they don't care about the life and ministry of the church. That's very important to them, but they're going to focus in on typically one aspect of, of biblical or theological studies. Uh, so theology, New Testament, Old Testament, um, uh, church history, those sorts of things. Um, so, so a strong PhD candidate would have those two types as far as one a little bit more theologically, academically oriented. And then the other one, ministerially oriented, as far as bringing in two yeah, MAs? Yeah, for PhD program purposes, your strongest applications will have two different academic MAs. 
Uh, so for ours and for a lot of the evangelical PhD programs, because we're so committed to the importance of both uh, solid biblical and theological preparation for effective teaching, uh, most of our best candidates will have an MA that's in theology and an MA that's on the more biblical side of things. Or going back to Andy's point, they may have a really strong undergrad. Uh, they gave them a foundation in one of them and then an MA that developed them more deeply uh, in the other area. That's a good combination as well. Yeah, so we'll, uh, when I talk to students, um, and it's especially the students who do have a strong undergrad foundation, that they often find this dual um, start, do your MA in biblical exegesis, and then in just one additional year, you do an MA in theology, and you come out with a really strong shaping in the Bible and theology side of things, and um, which could set them up well for a PhD program or for uh, ministry. Um, so yeah, so we see a bit of that sort of combination happening amongst our students. So one thing just to emphasize that I don't think we've highlighted clearly yet, I think it's become pretty clear that the diversity of both MAs and kinds of MDivs that are out there means there is no right or wrong answer to this. Uh, it really does depend on who you are, what kind of preparation have you had, what kind of vocations do you see God leading you into as a next step in the process, uh, and, and how do various programs compare with respect to helping you move from where you are to where you anticipate needing to go next. Yeah. So one thing I don't see students doing very often in this conversation is uh, I feel like they often compare the MDiv and the MA almost as abstract ideas, like just thinking about should I do an MDiv or an MA, um, yeah, just almost as concepts, as it were, uh, as opposed to sitting down and actually looking at the classes that are listed for a particular MDiv program and the classes that are listed for a particular MA program. You really can't know how an MDiv or an MA will prepare you without looking at the specific classes that you're going to take. And then, of course, the faculty who will be teaching those classes. Uh, so one of my strong encouragements to you uh, would be not to try to have this conversation in kind of the abstract at the idea level, uh, but to look very specifically about what classes would I be taking if I went into this degree program, who would I be taking those classes from, and how well will that do in preparing me for whatever it is that I think I've got coming next. Yeah, and I, I would, uh, I think that's a great point, Mark, and, and I would say that when I look at myself, when I was thinking about an MDiv or an MA or MA program, I, I would have been a little bit shy about reaching out to a school and wanting to talk to somebody or talk to a faculty member. That would have felt a little bit um, like, wow, I don't want to waste anybody's time. I'm, I'm stupid. You know, I, I should know this stuff already. But I, I tell you, reaching out to schools to talk to their grad admissions counselors or talk to the program directors. I, I tell you, I, it's so great when I meet with students, you can just share with them more about your curriculum and they just have questions mm -hmm. that you can clarify. And sometimes it's like, they're like, thank you so much. Now I know the MA in biblical exegesis is not for me, you know? Or it's like, whoa, this just curriculum makes so much sense, you know? And so what, what schools are able to put on their websites, often you'll see a, something like a class called hermeneutics. In some schools, that will mean a very basic kind of um, nuts and bolts of inductive Bible study. And for others, it will mean something way different um, in terms of robust theoretical reflection on the nature of understanding text. So, um, so the more you can kind of push beyond what you see on the screen and kind of talk to either people who've gone there or to faculty or uh, directors and grad admissions folks, um, I think that will really help you in the discernment process. And I was going to say to your point as well, you guys had mentioned um, trying to connect with current students um, at yeah. the, the, uh, the program and a grad admission counselor could get you connected, get students yeah. connected to those, those current students to ask those questions for yeah. sure. And then I also noticed in your conversation that both of you actually visited the schools that you were interested in, the seminaries or the, the graduate schools. And so um, 
I feel like that's probably would, is helpful yeah. for students as well. Um, yeah. Although, would can you briefly talk about um, the pros and cons to uh, a online seminary degree versus a on campus seminary degree? Sorry, my brain went like four different directions all at the same time. Um, yes, I do think visiting campus is great. Um, and uh, particularly if we're, if we shift a little bit from picking between degree programs to pick, picking between schools, uh, which is a slightly different and much more complicated conversation. Mm -hmm. um, there is, uh, I mean, schools have kind of an ethos or a feel to them that is very difficult to discern if you never set foot on campus. Even good conversations like in this kind of a setting will only give you kind of a little bit of a, of a sense of what's going on there. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm struck by how often when I'm talking with a student and, and kind of asking questions about, so how did you end up here? Kind of why did you pick this school rather than that school? How hard it is for the student to answer to that question? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times there are, there are just a number of intangible things that go, that kind of lie in the background of a decision like that, that are very difficult to articulate, but are actually pretty important to the decision. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think the campus visit is, can play a, a significant role in that if you have the opportunity to do that. Um, online versus on campus um, is, uh, I think it probably has, uh, Andy might have a different sense in this than I do. I think it probably has more to do with, with again, who you are and what you need. Um, I mean, the, the advantage to online is, is, of course, not just flexibility, which is what people tend to think of most often, uh, you can kind of um, uh, shape your graduate education around the demands of life and whatnot. Um, uh, I think accessibility is probably an almost larger issue for a lot of students. Um, that it's not so much would I prefer online or in person um, as it is kind of where I am and who I am. Um, the online education is accessible to me in a way that a residential education isn't. Um, and those are tremendous strengths, uh, so that online education can be flexible and accessible in a way that in-person education simply will never be. Um, uh, I, I happen to be a big fan of in-person education, although I have actually taught a fair bit online. Uh, so uh, I think there are tremendous advantages that we need to tap into and make use of. Um, I just tend to think at the graduate level that opportunity to sit and have face-to-face -face conversations with people who come out of very different sets of life experiences. Um, that I can do quality education in certain kinds of ways online, but it's really difficult to replicate that sense of being shaped by a diverse group of people who think differently than I do about a set of issues um, uh, that you can in the classroom. So. Um, I tend to be like, if at all possible, I'm a proponent of uh, at least doing like one week intensives on campus because you can get a lot of that kind of life on life work in, in a one week intensive. Uh, so I'm kind of like, a, can we split the difference as much as possible and make residential education as like flexible and accessible as we can while still getting the value of being on campus? But Andy, yeah, um, yeah I, I would just echo that a lot of the students who I've talked to who've who do an online education would say i would love to be in person i would learn so much better if i was in person i miss being in person but they're just life circumstances just don't make it possible so for those in those it's like this is better than nothing right but with that i would just say evaluate some schools are doing it better than others and don't just go based on what's the cheapest online option. Do your research on who is doing this well. What are their strategies for trying to create online community amidst the training? Some schools are thinking strategically also about how can we be spiritually forming students amidst their online education. Um, so really do your homework on what online programs you're choosing. And I think COVID has forced a lot of schools to, to move to online who maybe weren't doing it before. Um, and some are probably doing it better than others. And, um, you know, if you're in that boat, I, I would just encourage you do your homework. Where's, where can you get the best online experience? Not just the cheapest, not just the fastest, but where can you be formed, um, formed best? So demonstration of being open and welcome.
and your perspective on how to talk about these things. I, I think it makes a lot of difference. Um, well, I think uh, it's time for us to wrap up and wanted to mention to you that we do have a free booklet. Let me show the picture of that. Okay, so this is something that Dr. Cortez put together and I, I think you'll find it very useful. And what I'm gonna do is send it in the chat I'm gonna send you a link so that you can download it right away. Also wanted to mention as um, both professors did mention, please come visit and come talk. And in that visit, you can choose who you'd like to talk to or if you wanna do a tour, you could do as much or as little as you'd like. And then also you could do a live virtual tour as in we'll have a current student walk you around campus with an iPhone and you can have a conversation as you go. And then also uh, Yuli, my uh, fellow counselor, uh, she works with international students. So if you are one or know someone who is, please invite them to talk to Yuli. And of course, I'll be your counselor if you're interested in any of the programs of biblical and theological studies. I want to thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Abernathy, Dr. Cortez. Thank you so much. Denise, really appreciate your inviting us to do the webinar. And of course, uh, Cassidy and Chucky, thank you very much for your time. So God bless you. Goodbye, everybody. Blessings. Bye. Bye.